Welcome to Reeducated TV, where we keep you informed. Many lives are shaped by religion, or should I say the scriptures. There has been different interpretations of the Bible, which has led to many disputes. We will explore the first books before the changes or the translations of the scripture by various translators were made. For the next couple of weeks, we will have Bible lessons, so to speak, and dive deeper into the original scripture and compare what was said before the translations were done. Now, some people may disagree, dislike, or disapprove of the information in the following weeks ahead. Just know, I am not against anyone or any religion. All my efforts are focused on finding the truth, whatever that is. So I bring you the root, the start, or beginning. It is totally up to you from there to do with it whatever you wish or like. Why am I having a Bible lesson? Well, I have noticed that every two comments someone quotes the scripture with their own interpretations, which shows that we have made these stories the basis of our lives and history. Jacob and Esau are frequently mentioned, and also Noah and his descendants. That won't be the topic today, but I will take you there slowly so you can have a full understanding. Today's topics are the ancient Persians of the religion of Abraham. First, book of Genesis, disingenuous conduct in the translation of the Bible. Abraham acknowledged more than one God. Volume 1, book 2, chapter 1 of the Anacalypsis, and it says, The religion and ancient philosophy of the Chaldeans by whom are meant the Assyrians, as given by Stanley, at first view exhibit a scene of the utmost confusion. This may be attributed in part to the circumstance that it is not the history of their religion and philosophy at any one particular era, but that it is extended over a space of several thousand years, during which perhaps they might undergo many changes. To this circumstance, authors have not paid sufficient attention, so that what may have been accurately described in the time of Herodotus may have been much changed in the time of Porphyry. Thus, different authors appear to write in contradiction to each other, though each may have written what was strictly true at the time of which he was writing. Immediately, they are letting you know that there has been much confusion in regards to the scriptures and that authors have not paid enough attention to what was said or accurately stated in the time of Herodotus versus what was said in the time of Porphyry. Porphyry was a philosopher of Tyre. You should know that Porphyry was a student of Platinus and Platinus was said to be the student of Ammonius Saccas, and together they founded Neoplatonism, out of which came Monism, Monotheism, and later Islam. Monoism is the doctrine that all reality can be derived from a single principle, the one, hence mono. So all these thinkers, self-taught philosophers, and their students didn't bother to search what was first said and state the facts, but instead they gave us what came from their minds and thoughts. Thus different authors appear to write in contradiction to each other, which leaves us confused and ultimately lost. Under the name of the country of the Chaldeans, several states have at different periods been included it has been the same with respect to Persia. When an author speaks of Persia, sometimes Persia only is meant, sometimes Bactria, sometimes Media, sometimes all three, and Assyria is very often included with them. Here is another source of difficulty and confusion. 
after the conquest of Babylon and its dependent states, the empire founded by its conquerors, the Persians, was often called by writers of the western part of the world, the Assyrians or Chaldean Empire. In all these states or kingdoms, the religion of the Persians prevailed, and the use of the indiscriminate terms Persian, Assyrian, and Chaldean by Porphyry, Plutarch, etc., when treating of that empire, has been the cause of much of the uncertainty respecting what was the religion of the Persians and Assyrians. Thus, when one historian says the Chaldeans, meaning the Assyrians, worshipped the idols of Moloch, and another says they worshipped fire as the emblem of the deity, they are probably both correct. One assertion is true before the time of Cyrus, the other afterward. Right? So the Chaldeans are the Assyrians, or were the Assyrians. Then the Persians invaded. Subsequently, the religion of the Persians prevailed, and the indiscriminate use of the terms Persians, Assyrians, and Chaldeans by these great thinkers, such as Porphyry, Plutarch, and others, have caused much uncertainty pertaining to the religion of the Persians and the Assyrians. I should add that Plutarch was also a thinker and philosopher whose works strongly influenced the evolution of the essay, biography, and historical writing. The translation of Plutarch was said to have influenced Shakespeare, Montaigne, Goethe, and was also said to have inspired leaders of the French revolutions. Now, Montaigne, Goethe, and Shakespeare were playwrights. They were storytellers. Although it may not be possible to make out a connected and complete system, yet it will be no difficult matter to show that at that one particular time, the worship of the Assyrians, Chaldeans, Persians, Babylonians was that of one supreme God, that the sun was worshipped as an emblem only of the divinity, and that the religions of Abraham, of the children of Israel, and of these eastern nations were originally the same. The Christian divines, who have observed the identity of course maintain that the other nations copied from Moses, or the natives of Palestine, that is, that several great and mighty empires copied from a small and insignificant province. No doubt this is possible, whether probable or not must be left to the judgment of the reader, after he has well considered all the circumstances detailed in the following work. Now, the other nations could not have copied from Moses, which I have shown in so many ways. Let's continue. The very interesting and ancient book of Genesis, on which the modern system of the reformed Christian religion is chiefly founded, has always been held to be the production of Moses, but it requires very little discernment to perceive that it is a collection of treatises probably of different nations. The first ends with the third verse of the second chapter, the second with the last verse of the fourth. In the first verse of the first book, the Alehim, which will be proved to be the Trinity, being in the plural number, are said by wisdom to have formed from matter previously existing. The SMIM are planetary bodies, which were believed by the Magi to be the rulers or directors of the affairs of men. This opinion I shall examine by and by. From this it is evident that this is in fact a Persian or still more Eastern mythos. So, the Alehim, which is the correct Hebrew name before it was corrupted by modern Jews to Elohim, originally means the Creator preserver and the destroyer, the mediator, preserver or intervener, the trinity, the man, the woman and the S-U-N, the double being. Al is thought to be the masculine nature of God, 
but among the ancient Arabs of which the word Al came from was used in the feminine nature for the sun and the moon was masculine. The Alaim in its plural form is the Trinity and in its singular form is the Godhead out of which wisdom was formed. Please take note that the wisdom that was formed was the Buddha, Saka, Skill or Skillet, Ras or Razit, in which all means wisdom, which is referring to the sun. In other words, the wisdom is the sun, or the sun is the wisdom. In its mythos, which originated from the East or the Indus, no, the modern system of the Reformed Christian religion was founded on the ancient book of Genesis and was always thought to be a production of Moses, but it is rather a series of treatises written by different people at different times. I have already shown you that Moses is a mythos, which will also be fully explained in the following weeks. The use of animals for food being clearly not allowed to man in chapter 1 verses 29 and 30 is a circumstance which bespeaks the book of Buddhist origin. It is probably either the parent of the Buddhist religion or its offspring, and it is different from the next book which begins at the fourth verse of the second chapter and ends with the last verse of the fourth because among other reasons in it the creation is said to have been performed by a different person from that named in the first by Jehovah Alehim instead of Alehim again in the first book man and woman are created at the same time in the second they are created at different times. Again, in the first book, the fruit of all the trees is given to the man. In the second, this is contradicted by one tree being expressly forbidden. These are in fact two different accounts of the creation. The beginning of the fifth chapter or third trap seems to be a repetition of the first to connect with the history of the flood. The world is described as being made by God, Alehim, and not as in the second by Jehovah, or the God Jehovah, or Jehovah, Alehim, and is in the first, the man and woman are made at one time, and not as in the second at different times. The account of the birth of Seth, given in the 25th verse of the 4th chapter, and the repetition of the same event in the third verse of the fifth chapter or the beginning of the third tract are a clear proof that these tracts are by different persons or at least are separate and distinct works. The reasons why the name of Seth is given here and not the names of any of the latter of Adam's children is evidently to connect Adam with Noah and the flood, the object of the third tract. The permission in the third track to eat animals implying that it was not given before is strictly in keeping with the denial of it in the first, right? First of all, the first book is the offspring of the Buddhist religion, the ancient Buddha that is. The first ancient book was called the Razit or Ras, which originated from the Indus. Secondly, the use of animals for food not being allowed to man in chapter 1 verses 29 and 30 is of Buddhist origin. They stated that the second book is different from the first. In the first, the use of animals is not permitted to man, but in the second book, the use of animals for food was allowed. It also mentions in the second book, it says, Creation was formed by the Jehovah Alehim instead of Alehim in the first. The question is, why were changes made? We will soon find out. In the first book, man and woman was created of the same time. In the second, they are created at different times. Also in the first book, the fruits of all the trees are given to man, which is contradicted in the second book where one tree is forbidden. No, it mentions the birth of Seth 
and that the names of Adam's children were not mentioned in the chapters where Seth was mentioned, which shows that they were written by separate persons and are not the same figures and was evidently done to connect Adam and Noah and the flood. Now you see why the changes were made. Seth has no connection to Adam or Noah. In other words, Adam, his children, and Noah and his descendants were created to connect the flood. I want my viewers to know that Seth was a part of the original creation story of Egypt, not Adam. There was no Adam. You can watch my video, The Genesis Story Exposed, to get a better understanding of the mythos of Seth. Okay, let's continue. The histories of the creation, both in the first and in the second book of Genesis, in the sacred books of the Persians, and in those of the Chaldeans, are evidently different versions of the same story. The Chaldeans state the world to have been created not in six days, but in six periods of time, the length of the periods not being fixed. The Persians also divide the time into six periods. In the second book, a very well-known account is given of the origin of evil, which is an affair most closely interwoven with every part of the Christian system, but it is in fact nothing more than an oriental mythos which may have been taken from the history of the ancient Brahmins, in whose books the principal incidents are to be found, and in order to put this matter out of doubt, it would only be necessary to turn to the plates to figures 2, 3, 4 taken from icons in the very oldest of the caves of Hindustan. Excavated, as it is universally agreed, long prior to the Christian era, the reader will find the first to be the seed of the woman bruising the serpent's head, the second, the serpent biting the foot of her seed, the Hindu god Krishna, the second person of their trinity, and the third, the spirit of God, brooding over the face of the waters. The history in Genesis is here so closely depicted that it is impossible to doubt the identity of the two. So the histories of the creation story in the first and in the second book of Genesis, the sacred books of the Persians and in those of the Chaldeans are different versions of the same story. They mentioned that both the Persians and Chaldeans state the world to have been created in six periods of time and not six days. In the second book, an account of the origin of evil is mentioned, which is a big part of the Christian system and is nothing but a mythos that was taken from the ancient Brahmins. In future work, I will explain and show what was originally meant by the Brahmans of evil, hell, or the bottomless pit, the eight gods of hell. The Mayans had four gods of hell. All this myth of evil and hell has a true meaning. The eight gods of hell, the Mayans four gods of hell, and the Christians evil and devil in hell are all myths and should not be taken literal. When I reveal the true meaning in the coming weeks, it will blow your mind. You will soon find out that all the mythos of the world has to do with you, us, we, and the universe that has been lost to myths. There was also mention of the figures in the caves of Hindustan which is universally agreed were way before the Christian era. The figures shows the ancient trinity where the child or the seed of the woman is bruising the serpent's head. The second is the serpent biting the foot or her seed who was Krishna. The third was the spirit of God brooding over the face of the waters. The three in one and one in three the Trinity found in India ages before.
you can also see that the mythos of the Indus and the mythos or the history in Genesis is close or similar. The same mythos, except for a few changes. Among the Persians and all the Oriental nations, it has been observed that the Creator or God was adored under a triple form, in fact, in the form of a trinity. In India, this was Brahma, Krishna or Vishnu, and Shiva. In Persia, it was Aromazdes, Mithra, and Arimanias. In each case, the Creator, the Preserver, and the Destroyer. I shall now proceed to show that, in this particular, the religion of Abraham and the Israelites was accordant with all the others. We have already established that the Trinity existed ages ago. Now we will establish that the religion of Abraham and the Israelites were similar to all the others, and that the name Ie Ue for Vols is the original name of the old Hebrew or Paleo Hebrew creator. The Hebrew language had four vowels, but they were kept hidden by the scribes. This is how it would be written in Hellenistic Greek or Koine Greek, which is read from left to right. The Z is a I in English, E, then the Y is actually a U in English, and then a E, which gives you the word E E O E the original name of the Creator. There was no God. The word God or Gods are deities. You should also know that there was no Lord. The word Lord was afterward implemented, which signifies authority and sovereign. We will also establish that in the first book, the Creator had many names. Let's continue. Before I proceed, I must point out an example of very blamable disingenuousness in every translation of the Bible, which I have seen. In the original, God is called by a variety of names, often the same as that which the heathens gave their gods. To disguise this, the translators have availed themselves of a contrivance adopted by the Jews in rendering the Hebrew into Greek, which is to render the word E -e -o -e, and several of the other names by which God is called in the Bible by the word Lord which signifies one having authority the sovereign in this the Jews were justified by the commandment which forbids the use of the name e -e -o -e, but not so the Christians who do not admit the true and evident meaning adopted by the Jews Thou shalt not take the name of e -e -o -e, thy God in vain, and therefore they have no right. When pretending to give a translation, to call God by any other name than that in the original, whether it be Adonis or e -e, or e -e -o -e, or any other, this the reader will immediately see is of first importance in obtaining a correct understanding of the book. The fact of the names of God being disguised in all the translations tends to prove that no dependence can be placed on any of them. The fact shows very clearly the temper or state of mind in which the translators have undertaken their task. God is called by several names. How is the reader of a translation to discover this? If he finds them all rendered by one name, he is evidently deceived. It is no justification of a translator to say it is of little consequence, little or great. He has no right to exercise any discretion of this kind. When he finds God called Adonai, he has no business to call him Jehovah or Elohim. Right? They have no right to change the original names of the Creator to Jehovah or any other name of their liking. So we clearly see the disingenuineness in the translation of the Bible in regards to the Creator's names. Among other changes that were made, in short, we were deceived. There is no way we would know the true names 
because the creator was referred to as Jehovah and Elohim. Why would they change the names of the creator is the question. Okay, let's continue. The fact that Abraham worshipped several gods who were in reality the same as those of the Persians, namely the creator, preserver, and the destroyer has been long asserted and the assertion has been very unpalatable both to Jews and many Christians. And to obviate or disguise what they could not account for, they have had recourse in numerous instances to the mistranslation of the original as will presently be shown. So some have purposely translated the scriptures wrong and others have mistranslated the original scriptures. Whatever they did not understand, they replaced with what they saw fit. The following text will clearly prove this assertion. The Reverend Dr. Shuckford pointed out the fact long ago, so that this is nothing new. In the second book of Genesis, the creation is described not to have been made by Alehim or the Alehim, but by a god of a double name, e i u e Alehim, which the priests have translated Lord God. By using the word Lord, their object evidently is to conceal from their readers several difficulties which arise afterward respecting the names of God. And this word, and which show clearly that the books of the Pentateuch are the writings of different persons. Dr. Shuckford has observed that in Genesis chapter 12 verses 7 and 8, Abraham did not call upon the name of the Lord as we improperly translate it, but invoked God in the name of the Lord, that is e -E -O -E, whom he worshipped and who appeared to him, and that this was the same God to whom Jacob prayed when he vowed that the Lord should be his God. Again in Genesis chapter 28 verses 21 and 22, and he called the place Bit Alehim. Again, Shuckford says that in Genesis chapter 26, verses 25, Isaac invoked God as Abraham did in the name of this Lord, I -e -u -e, or Jehovah. On this, he observes, it is very evident that Abraham and his descendants worshipped not only the true and living God, but they invoked him in the name of the Lord, and they worshipped the Lord in whose name they invoked, so that two persons were the object of their worship, God and this Lord, and the scripture has distinguished these two persons from one another by this circumstance, that God no man hath seen at any time, nor can see, but the Lord whom Abraham and his descendants worship was the person who appeared to them. In the above, I need not remind my reader that he must insert the name of e -E -U -E, or Jehovah for the name of the Lord. Chapter 21 verse 33 is wrong translated. When properly rendered, it represents Abraham to have invoked in the name of Jehovah the everlasting God, that is to have invoked the everlasting God or to have prayed to him in the name of Jehovah, precisely as the Christians do at this day, who invoke God in the name of Jesus, who invoke the first person of the Trinity in the name of the second. And you can see the words of this text right here, in Hebrew and in Latin. So we see that Abraham worshipped two gods, the I-E-U-E, -E, the e -E -O -E, and this Lord in a similar manner as the Christians do today who invoke God in the name of Jesus, who invoke the first person of the Trinity in the name of the second. The foregoing observations of Dr. Shuckford's are confirmed by the following text, Genesis chapter 31 verses 42, except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac, and Genesis 31 verses 53, the gods of Abraham and the gods of Nahar, the gods of their father judge betwixt us, that is, the gods of Terah, 
the great-grandfather of both Jacob and Laban. It appears that they went back to the time when there could be no dispute about their gods. They sought for gods that should be received by them both, and these were the gods of terror. Laban was an idolater, or at least of a different sect or religion. Rachel stole his gods. Jacob was not, and in consequence of the difference in their religion, there was a difficulty in finding an oath that should be binding on both. It clearly shows that there were several gods, the gods of their father, Abraham gods, and the gods of Nehar. The part about Jacob, Rachel, Laban, and Nahar will be fully explained in the future if you have not already seen what's taking place. In Genesis chapter 35 verse 1, it is said, And Alehim, God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God Lal, that appeared unto thee, when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. If two gods at least, or a plurality in the Godhead, had not been acknowledged by the author of Genesis, the words would have been, And make there an altar unto me, that or unto me, because I appeared. So this verse clearly shows two gods, where the god Alehim told Jacob to go to Bethel and dwell there, and that he should make an altar to the god Lal, that appeared unto him. Now, the question is, why would the Creator say to make an altar for the god Lal and not the Creator Allahim himself? In Genesis chapter 49 verse 25, By the god Al of thy father also he will help thee, and the Sadai, or the SDI, the city, also shall bless thee with blessings. It is worthy of observation that there is a marked distinction between the Al of his father who will help him and the Sadi or the Sadai who will bless him. Here are two evidently clear and distinct gods and neither of them the destroyer or the evil principle. Here we can see the clear distinction between the Al his father who will help him and the Sadai or Sidi is the one who gives a blessing. There are two gods, so we see the Creator disguised as the Father, the Preserver disguised as blessings, but no destroyer. In other words, the Trinity, the Creator, Preserver, and Destroyer. Even by the God Al of thy Father who shall help thee, and by the I Mighty, Omnipotent, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast and of the womb. The Sidi or Sadai are here very remarkable. They seem to have been peculiarly gods of the blessings of this world. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, this Mr. Hales has correctly observed ought to be rendered Jehovah our gods is one Jehovah. The doctrine of a plurality shown above in the Pentateuch is confirmed in the later books of the Jews. In Isaiah chapter 48 verse 16 it says, And now the Lord Adonai Jehovah hath sent me and his spirit. Again in Isaiah chapter 51 verse 22 Thus thy Adonai Jehovah spoke and thy Allahim reprimanded his people. Again there is clearly two gods the God Adonai Jehovah and Alehim. Now we shall see that the destroyer was disguised as a snake that tempted Eve and the serpent set up by Moses in the wilderness. Two persons of the Trinity are evident in these texts. The third is found in the serpent which tempted Eve in its evil character and in its character of regenerator, healer or preserver in the brazen serpent set up by Moses in the wilderness to be adored by the Israelites and to which they offered incense from his time through all the reigns of David and Solomon to the time of Hezekiah, the name of which was Nehushtan. In Numbers chapter 21 verses 8, 9 and 2, 
and in Kings chapter 18 verse 4, the destroyer or evil spirit may also probably be found in the Aob, named Leviticus chapter 20 verse 27. And in Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 11, there are many expressions in the Pentateuch besides those already given, which cannot be accounted for without a plurality of gods or the Trinity, a doctrine which was not peculiar to Abraham and his descendants, but was common to all the nations of the ancient world, from India to Thule, as I have before observed, under the triple title of Creator, Preserver, and Destroyer, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, among the Hindus, Aramazdes, Mithra, and Arhimanius, among the Persians, we shall see in the next chapter that the Trinity will be found in the word Aleim of the first verse of Genesis, which will tend to support what I have asserted, that is, that it is an Indian book. So all the mythos or religions are the same, disguised in several ways or manner. The first book of Genesis was taken from the book of wisdom, the Ras, the Razit of the Indus. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Take care.